I am Vinny Tutterich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. Just like the woman on the other mic, uh, she's been in here before. She's one of my favorites. I'm talking about the wonderful Dr. Kate Shanahan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kate, it, it, it's always wonderful to talk to you. I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Vinny. It's always wonderful to talk to you, too. The, the thing I don't think, you know, it's funny how the Internet works. People always say to me, they'll come on Twitter, you know, they're new followers, they'll come on Instagram or wherever, and they'll go, hey, I, I just read this book by this, you know, one of your older books, we're talking about your newer book today. I just, this woman, you need to get her on a show. Her name is Dr. Kate Shanahan. And it's like, yeah, oh yeah. We had Kate and her husband in the studio, like in person, 10 years ago when we first started this. It might even have been longer. I was thinking about that too. I was because it was when I was working with the Lakers, it was like early on. And yeah, uh, yeah I think by 10 years ago, I'd already almost left California. So it might have been like 12. It, it, it was it was right at the beginning of the show, and you guys showed up at Anna's studio in her garage when we first started this show, and and you've probably been on the show three, four other times since then, at least. Sounds about right. And I think I've interviewed your husband by himself, who who's a, a tour de force all on his own, at least one or two times after that. Yep, yep, exactly. Yes, yeah. we go way back. Yeah, old <laughs> friends. And you were the first. At first, you, you were talking about and I, the, the Lakers, right? You were at a game. You noticed these guys. You noticed their hands were swollen, if I remember right, or something like that. Like they, they had sausage fingers. And that was the beginning of Hello. you, right? Go, go on. It was like they were wearing oven mitts, and one of them in particular, Dwight Howard, because he was fump, like the ball was bouncing off of his fingers instead of he had no like apparent athlete's reflex to catch the ball. It was literally just go bonk. Yeah. And that was related to a, a condition he had that was coming from his diet. He thought it was because of the surgery, but he had had surgery low down on his back and he had tingling in his feet. So he, it was kind of natural for him to think it was affecting his hands, but it wasn't. That was a form of a dysesthesia, which is something that you get when you've got pretty bad metabolic uh, disruption and a pretty, you know, bad case of insulin resistance. And his weight was normal. His body fat percentage was like, you know, four to eight percent. So here he was, a guy with a complication of type two diabetes, there's dysesthesias, paresthesias in his hands, um, a sort of a variation on diabetic neuropathy. And he had like the more than ideal body weight and body fat. And so this was kind of a great example of how at that point in time, really nobody was talking about metabolic disease or insulin resistance or the fact that your metabolic health was not reflected in your body fat composition. Um, and so like that's what I really wanted to focus on at that point in time and help the Lakers trainers and the Lakers training staff. And of course the players understand that just because they look in the mirror and they see just gleaming muscles doesn't mean that their diet isn't hurting their health. That right. Was a big take home for them. You, by the way, Kate, you were, you were the first person to bring up seed oils early on this show. And no one else, and folks, I mean, no one else was talking about seed oils. And I'll never forget the first time you, you mentioned it, I just kind of let it pass over. It's like, seed oils? Wait a minute. I've been taking Udo's oil for my omegas for a gazillion years. What is she talking about? That's a seed oil, right? There's three or four seed oils mixed in there. I've been taking flaxseed for years. I didn't know what I didn't know about seed oil. Now, listen, I, I don't fry foods. I wasn't using the corn oils and all this type of stuff. And But I was 
I was literally spooning in seed oils every day along with my fish oil. I'm, I've always said I'm a diesel. I run on oil, right? It, I, you know, olive oil, fish oil, and on top of that, I would take some, some seed oils for health. You were early money on this, Kate. And I think everyone is following you. Well, thank you for saying that because, you know, like you've been, uh, you and I have gone back through time now and we've seen nobody talking about uh, seed oils. We've seen maybe even the rise and perhaps a slight fall, I don't know, of the keto diet uh, just because vegan is now so strong, right? Not because there's anything wrong with the keto diet. But I think, and this is this is kind of why I had to write another book about the dark, uh, called Dark Calories. No. that um, my research has convinced me that the reason that the keto diet wasn't working very well, and it, the reason it wasn't super popular until right around 2017, when Mark Sisson's book, The Primal Blueprint, came out, is because the other Atkins books and keto diet practitioners were not paying attention to these oils because Atkins himself didn't pay attention and frankly, when the first keto diet, you know, was invented back in the um, uh, like 1921, uh, depending who you ask, somewhere around that time frame, seed oils were not in the food supply. So it was not an issue. It did not. You could just follow a keto diet. But when that book came out, Mark Sisson and his co-writer, uh, Brad Kearns, they made sure they knew that I was talking about seed oils and that they were problematic. And, and they made sure to put that in their keto book and that was really the first one that you know because that book shot up to new york times bestseller for i don't know how long it was really the first book that put the seed oils on the map for then other keto influencers to kind of um grab a hold of and that message and add it in and build it into the keto message yeah no and <clears throat> I give you a lot of you know, look. You deserve all of the credit. What, what, how did you come upon the seed oil thing? Well, I was a chemist. I was a biochemist, so uh, you know, and a and a medical doctor. But first, I was a biochemist. I actually went to Cornell to study biochemistry, so I could. Uh, I really wanted to engineer bacteria, genetically engineer bacteria that could digest plastic. Because, uh, you know, I grew up sort of in the 70s and 80s and the landfills were filling up with plastic and already at that point in time. And so I wanted to be a part of the solution to that problem. And when I went to Cornell, I learned uh, in their biochemistry and molecular biology program, they were one of the same. Um, I also learned a lot about polyunsaturated fatty acids. And I never thought I would put that to use again, you know, once I had decided, oh gosh, this genetic and engineering thing, I don't think we're going to be able to do much with plastic digestion, bacteria with through genetic engineering for at least a long time. I wasn't going to wait. I just wanted to do something that where I could get more immediate results. And so I went to medical school. I kind of bailed out on uh, my PhD program that I was in. And I went to medical school and I just kind of gave up, you know, a lot, I forget, I was planning to forget all of the hard work that I learned while I was there. But um, after medical school, I was practicing as a doctor and I was a little, un I was really unhappy. I was a third of the time I was really unhappy in my practice because about a third of my patients, I really felt like I was not making a difference. I was perhaps even, you know, lying to them about the importance of taking their, their chronic medications, you know, the, the refilling these prescriptions as we do for right. especially high blood pressure and wasn't sure about high cholesterol medication. I wasn't sure what was, if they were helping because my patients would take them and they would still end up in the hospital with the things that they were supposed to pre be for preventing like heart attacks and strokes and kidney failure and stuff like that. So, so being like unhappy in my practice, I felt like something was missing and I had no idea what it was, no idea of any. Um, and it wasn't until I got sick myself, and I'm sure you've heard this story a million times, doctors don't question what we learn. We don't look to nutrition 
unless we're really like this, something really strange happens. So I myself got really sick. I couldn't walk. I had a strange um, neurotropic virus growing in my body and my um, affecting my joints. And not until Luke, my husband, suggested that all the sugar I was eating might be not great for my you know, immune system um, and I was sick, did I reconsider looking at what I was actually eating in nutrition? And that's where I came across vegetable oils. And then pretty quickly, once I looked at what is even vegetable oil made out of, it was what are these essential fats that they're supposed to be so good for us for? Like back then, vegetable oils were heavily promoted as being heart healthy. Sure. And and so um, I, I was like, what, what's going on here? What Because this chemistry here, what I saw in the chemistry had me a bit concerned because once I started looking at what they were, the first thing I saw was that they had two double bonds closely spaced next to each other. And in Cornell, one thing I learned that changed my life in Cornell was that two closely spaced double bonds make a molecule subject to oxidation and that can create toxins. Oxidation creates toxins. So that's where I got really curious. And just from there, uh, had to learn a lot more and it took a long time to put it all together, even for the first book. And I've been continuing the process. And so my latest book has all new information, believe it or not. That's, that's just how bad they are for us. The new book, folks, she mentioned it just a minute ago. It's called Dark Calories. Uh, you want to read it for one reason and one reason only. I get an acknowledgement at the end. So uh, that's how you know I read the book, Kate. <laughs> like, Wait a minute. Acknowledgements? Let's see here. Let's see what's going on here. Um, and uh, I, look, there's some pretty heady company, and uh, most of them are doctors, and you give people like me. And, and I look at that and I go, you know, thank you. You know, and I want to thank you publicly and on, on this show. Thank you for doing that because sometimes you feel like you're just working in a bubble. And I know you feel like that sometimes. Uh, in this book, Dark Calories, let's start with that. Why the name Dark Calories? You, you mentioned hangry, getting hangry. Uh, let's start with that. I'm, and look, we're going to go through it all. I want to get into the, the hateful eight and the delightful I think dozen uh, and this sort of thing. But let's start with the name of the book. Why did we come up with that term? And talk about the hangry thing that you you talked about in the book. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I call it dark calories because right now metabolic disease is the biggest problem we're all facing. Diabetes and obesity are out of control. Obesity, uh, like there, the number of people who are 100 pounds or more overweight as adults is something like one in 10 now. And that was practically non-existent when I was in medical school. I, I, I don't remember seeing a single person that- What year were you, when, when you were in medical school, what year was that? Okay. Yeah, I, I don't mean to date you, but- That's fine. You know, I like, you had to ask, I had to bring it up. So uh, here's the, the raw truth. I was in medical school, I entered medical school in 1994. Um, so, you know, th that was a long time ago and I, it wasn't until I was in residency in 1998 in residency, my second year where I saw somebody who was a hundred more than hundred pounds overweight. So that just gives you an idea of how rare it was, um, where, I mean, I personally interacted, you know, as a patient of, um, as a doctor, I mean, they were my patient. So, it, so it was very rare and now it's one in 10. So obesity is the biggest problem. 30% of the average American's calories now come from these seed oils. Back when I was in medical school, that was more like 15% or 10%. It was much lower. Now it's 30%. And doctors still have very little idea what they what makes them bad for us. And nobody in the medical research industry is talking about why they might be bad for us. Nobody's seriously looking at them. So it's like they're invisible, right, Dark? Right. But there's another reason too, right? It's it's the more sinister sinister side of it. And that gets back to the fact that I actually had learned that they were healthy. And why was that? And so I dive into that in the book. And that has to do with the dark side of human nature, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, I want to talk about that. But you, you asked me a second question. No, well, hangry. that was, you know, what, what, the hangry part of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So getting back to we're all running around talking about, you know, we have an obesity crisis. No one is putting this together with another thing that has happened. 
me being the the use of the term hangry. The first time I was on your show, Vinny, we didn't talk about hangry. I don't think anybody was talking about hangry back in you know oh. whatever that was, 2011 or 12. Hangry is now s- such a common thing. It's in the dictionary. And so many people have it. They talk about it as if it's just normal hunger, but it's not. It's caused by oxidative stress, which is changes our cravings. And it's so important to understand that hangry, if you have hangry, that means you have a metabolic disease. And the name of that metabolic disease is insulin resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I couldn't agree more. Whenever people jump on me, you know, I'll put something on my Instagram or whatever, and they'll say, you don't know what you're talking about. I can have a little rice. What's wrong with having a, and it's like, yeah, you can, maybe you can. But if you're metabolically broken, good luck. You know, you, you've you've punched your card. You, you can no longer. That's like telling an alcoholic you can have the occasional drink. You cannot. You and, and the thing is, Vinny, that according to what I looked at, the tables. You know, how how do you define insulin resistance? Well, I define it as an elevated HOMA IR score, meaning I look at your insulin level fasting and I look at your blood sugar fasting, plug it into a calculator called a HOMA IR calculator. And if that number is high, then you have insulin resistance. Now, there are no, there is no agreement, no consensus on what a normal number is for HOMA IR. But my research suggests that it's 1.0. And guess how many, what percentage of Americans have a HOMA IR score of 1.0, according to a, a national, the, the NHANE study, which is like a huge national database. of. All right, let, me, let, me, let me do a legitimate guess. Uh, if you're saying guess is going to be way lower than I think it's going to be. Um, so I'm going to go with a super low number. I'm going to say only 30%. So approximately one third of Americans have a normal IR. HOMA IR, right. It's worse than that, Vinny. It's worse than, you know, and, and you probably got a way better guess than the average doctor because most doctors don't even really think much about metabolic disease at all. Uh, right. We're busy talking about risk factors, you know. Uh, yeah. We don't really think about what is metabolism, what is it doing? We don't, we don't use the term. I don't have a lot of medical lectures where I'm hearing the term metabolic disease. You know, I'm, I'm mostly hearing about risk factors. So the conversation should be about risk factors and um, I'm sorry, the conversation should be about metabolic disease instead of risk factors. And uh, the HOMA IR should be what we're talking about when we're talking, when we're trying to diagnose people with metabolic disease. And the percentage of people who have a normal HOMA IR score of 1.0 is get this, less than 1%. Jesus Christ. It, it's, I, I thought when, I said, when you said less than 30, I, I figured you were going to say 25, 20%. Less, no, than, less than one. It's it's um, <clears throat> we are living amongst a population that is medically damaged, and this is why um, this is why the book dark calories. I think it needs to trigger a whole new conversation about what health is. Right. Because we're not seeing it when we look around. We don't. Doctors are not seeing it. Doctors think that. A person who have normal weight is healthy if they don't have the risk factors that that they're taught about, like high blood pressure or abnormal um, waist circumference, circumference, or some other biomarkers that doctors learn about, um, which include like a HDL level, triglycerides, blood sugar, urine microalbumin, the things that a doctor will screen you for during your physical. None of those things will pick up whether or not you have insulin resistance as defined by a HOMA IR. That's interesting because it makes me wonder if I'm in that 1% or not, right? Yeah. Because I do everything on steroids, right? I, I shouldn't use the word steroids because people are going to go, wait, are you on steroids? No. I do everything to the nth degree, right? I'm always doing aerobics every day and doing uh, re- resistance training and eating on point and never, ever eating. I, ha- I haven't had a seed oil since probably, well, even before you came on, before I knew they were bad, the only ones I probably had was the ones on the spoon. I wasn't eating fried foods and what have you. And I'm wondering if I'm on that list of 1%. 
And probably not, right? Probably not. So the only way you would get there is if you were following a diet that would promote oxidative stress. And I want to talk about what that is um, but in a second. But let's let's hone in a little bit more on whether or not you really were avoiding seed oils because most restaurants use them. And, you know, when I was on uh, with one of your friends, um, Adam Carolla, I told him, yeah, you know, most uh, most people are getting a lot more of these oils and they realize and he interrupted, interrupted me in his way and he goes, nah, I don't sit down and eat a box of Hydrox. And, yeah. you know, I, I had to like or reorient like, you know what? when you go to a fancy sit down restaurant, still you're getting about 30% of your calories from these oils. Yeah. Because they're well, in I, I, so can, can, and everything. So what can, about you, Vinny? Were you, were you avoiding them at restaurants too? Let, let's do me, right? Since I'm here and we'll, we'll see where I might be. Um, my wife and I, we are down to maybe a restaurant meal once a month. Because because of that, you can't get good food in a restaurant. And usually when we're doing it, it's a piece of fish, which may have seed oils on it. We don't know. Or it's a steak restaurant, right? So it's, it's some, and we're eating that. So one, maybe once a month, we just don't eat out anymore because of that. Um, so that's off the table. Uh, breakfast is always eggs with real butter. Great. Um, I take coconut oil um, every day just to keep my key, you know, just to have medium chain triglycerides going all day long. Um, boo -boo -boo -boo. I never eat any kind of, if I have peanut butter or something like that, it's fresh peanuts that are mashed right into butter. And I do very little of that. Great. Very little. Um, dinner is always meat, fish pork, chicken, one of those. So th there's no, there's no seed oils ever going in. We don't use avocado oil to cook with because I'm afraid that it could be mixed with the seed oil, right? Yeah, yeah there's no regulation. And, there's yeah. no regulation on that because we know that from olive oil, right? We know that olive oil can be cut up to 40%, right? We learn right. that. Right. So, I'm very particular about the olive. We, we, as a matter of fact, we're going to do an ad here in a minute for an olive oil company that I can put my name on because I know the owners of the company and I know there's no seed oils, right? So I go out of my way to, to bypass seed oils. So that's out. I rarely eat any kind of sugar. I rarely, twice a year in Louisiana, I might have cat fried catfish, maybe twice a year. <laughs> Probably uh -huh. once a year. Okay. So that's, nice. that's it. I mean, I pretty much live like a monk. Very good. So, I mean, that's really what you have to do, unfortunately, because they are coming at you at, from everywhere, right? Like at your workplace, cafeteria, in the hospital, they're feeding them to you. In prisons, of course, uh, you know, incarcerated people eat more seed oils, as much seed oils as school children because they're in... They're in the school cafeterias, they're in the university cafeterias when you're required to pay for your college um, students meal plan. They're feeding your child seed oils. You know, most of the fats are going to be seed oils because of government regulations that, that disallow a certain percentage of fat, saturated fat it has to be less than 10 percent of saturated fat. That means they can't use butter. They can't use whole milk. They can't use, uh, you know, regular hamburger meat that's got 70 percent uh, lean and 30% fat. So it's everywhere and it's an assault. Um, you know, the whole world is out there trying to shove seed oil down your gullet. But the thing is, let's, let's talk more about, you know, what else you can do maybe that, um, mm -hmm. you may not know that is promoting oxidative stress in the body because seed oils are the worst of the worst. And the vegetable oils, I also call them vegetable oils. And really I define them as the hateful eight. They are the worst of the worst. And maybe before we move on to other things, I should just list out the hateful eight real quick. Let's do it. Great. Um, so the hateful eight are the corn, canola, cotton seed, soy, sunflower, safflower. Those are the six you really need to memorize actually, because those six are on ingredients. When you're going grocery shopping, they're going to be listed. Um, the, Grocery store products don't yet have much of the other two. Though these other two, rice, rice bran, and grapeseed, those are mostly in um, restaurants, along with the hateful eight in restaurants. Um, so that's that's what they are. And um, 
and they are the worst of the worst uh, because they they contain you know when you cook foods with these oils, you generate serious cancer causing mitochondria destroying nerve nerve uh, cell damaging toxins like uh, acrylamide and um, four hydroxy nonanol and all of these are a category of toxin that um, when you combine them all together, they're the same category of toxin, I should say, that makes cigarettes smoked bad for us. Right. Um, you know, cigarette smoking causes cancer, it causes emphysema, it causes um, uh, strokes, it causes heart attacks, it causes, uh, you know, all kinds of problems. But seed oils have the same sorts, the same category of toxin called alpha beta unsaturated al aldehydes. And French fries from a fast food restaurant have a one-to-one -one relationship with the amount of toxins as cigarettes, right? So if you have a pack of fries, I'm sorry, you should call it a pack of fries. If you have a five ounce serving of fries from any fast food restaurant or any fancy restaurant where they're using vegetable oils in the fryer, which is all of them now, um, then you just got the toxicity of smoking a pack of cigarettes. That's an amazing, I mean, think about that, folks. And you're giving this to your kids every day. You stop and you get them what's called, and I'm quoting, a happy meal. And that's that's what your kids are getting. I'm going to skip over to the delightful dozen for one second. I know we'll get to that in a minute. But there was something on your delightful dozen that I would have had in your hateful eight, but you've uh -huh. changed my mind. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and I want to ask you about this. I want to change. I want to make sure I'm on the right track. I've been telling people for millennia, well, not millennia, a decade, to stay away from peanut oil. You don't have that in your hateful eight, but it's a certain kind of peanut. It's not just any old fashioned peanut oil, right? right. Uh, so I want to just, we're going to get to your delightful dozen, but can we just take one out of the dozen and we'll call it the delightful 11 and you'll tell us about the other 11. Let's, let, let's include that in the hateful eight and, and explain why some, some of the uh, peanut oil is good for you. Yeah. So the refined peanut oil, I do not recommend. Um, but, uh, refined peanut oil has not made it into the hateful eight just yet. Um, but it, you know, I go back and forth on where it really belongs. Unrefined peanut oil is a totally different animal. So pe why is that? Well, it has to do with the fact that peanuts, unlike soy, corn, canola, cottonseed, the other hateful eight, peanuts have been cultivated by humans for thousands of years, and it has increased their suitability as an oil seed. In fact, we cultivated them in part expressly for use as an oil seed. And before we had factories, the only way we could extract oil was basically with a wedge press, you pour in the peanuts, you put a little um, piece of wood on top of it and you pound it with a mallet. So it's a very gentle process, no heat, no, um, pre no extreme pressure, and <clears throat> certainly no solvents. And so that's peanut, that peanut oil, is, that unrefined, basically extra virgin peanut oil is loaded with antioxidants and vitamins and it hasn't been damaged. And you, you can, at, in, unlike the other oils, you can mimic that somewhat at an industrial scale so that the crude peanut oil is edible. Wow. You might need to filter it. You might need to filter it a little bit, but it doesn't have toxins in it the way the hateful eight do. The crude hateful eight oils, crude soy, crude canola, even when they're organic, they are inedible. They're crude and rude and you can't eat them. They're vile smelling and they require like factories worth of processing. They got to be de-gummed, de-waxed. Uh, they got to be, the hexane has to be removed, which is the majority of it. Some of it doesn't have hexane in, in it. That can, that, that can be called organic, even though there's toxins in it still. Um, and they have to go through multiple processing steps to clean up that crude oil and make it so that it doesn't taste vile or look and smell vile. And even when they do that, it still has between one and 5% of various types of toxins in it when it leaves the factory and it goes, gets worse from there. So that's I, the I've often said that uh, seed oils 
could be literally, and I don't see this as a joke, could be used as gun oil, right? It's the same consistency as I, I've been a competitive skeet shooter for years, and uh -huh. we used oils to clean guns, right? You can use seed oils. The only difference is with the stuff that you buy from, you know, Remington or Hops or any of the gun companies that make oils is they add uh, like an industrial odor to it to let you know, oh, this is an oil that you use. It's not canola. Right. But you can easily use the same seed oils to clean a gun. Think about that. That That's crazy. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, they were not originally, so the seed oils, you know, are all, some of them like soy and corn have been cultivated, but they were not cultivated for oil for use as an oil and they are not treated gently during the manufacture and that's that is really the just make creates a world of difference now i know that it, it is gross that um canola oil was originally i think um a machine oil for world war ii and um uh, there might be another oil that was original. Oh yeah. Cottonseed oil was just a byproduct of the um, textile industry and they're used as machine oils and they're used as insecticides, but that alone isn't that, I don't know, it's gross, but it's to me, not that much of an indictment. If you know that um, we can use olive oil as an insecticide too. And right. people used to use tallow and butter actually as machine oil. Back when, if that's what they needed, they would just use right. like the the butter with more dirt in it, you know, right. because it all works. It's just, it's a, you know, they just need some kind of fat, right? So right. in and of itself, yeah, it's gross. And if it was originally made for that, we shouldn't be eating it, but it can't, it, it's, it's an indictment for sure, but it can't be the only indictment. And, and I'm bringing this up because of the debunkers out there. Who right. are trying to say, oh, you know, Dr. Kate doesn't know what she's talking about because, you know, like she says that it's bad for you because you can use it in an engine and, you know, whatever else they might want to say. I, like the truth is you can use a lot of healthy oils in an engine, too. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Be a waste. But but that's the only reason I bring that up, Vinny. So I'm glad you raised that point, because it, it is important to know that it's really, you know, weird chemistry things that happen too. Kate, I learned a long time ago, you, you can't deal with the haters. There, there are people out there, no matter what you say, they're going to just be antagonists on the internet to say, because they're, they're not really hating you. They're trying to climb on your back to, you know, jettison their career. Right. They, they, oh, yeah. You know, no, so I, I know. Like, it's so selfish. So I always say, you know, you know, my my friend always says, people say horrible things about you on Instagram and you don't answer them and you don't get rid of them. It's like, no, I leave their comments there so other people can enjoy the stupidity and the ignorance that's out there. They're not hurting me. I don't have time to go get rid of all of those comments. Uh, seriously. And I, you know, I, I, they used to bother me. I don't, they don't bother me anymore. But what does bother me is that those people will influence doctors Right. And, and some of the, them have convinced doctors to the degree that doctors now are going out there trying to debunk, not not me personally, but the, uh, necessarily, but the idea, the very idea that these oils are unhealthy. And they use some of these kind of, um, I guess they're almost like a straw man argument or a weaker argument. And, um, you know, that that's I I don't think things are going to change I, until doctors no. get on board. I, they they may never change, but I know if doctors don't get on board, it will never change. And I I do believe that if doctors get on board, it will change. And maybe not a hundred percent, but just imagine if ten percent of the good the restaurants out there said seed oil free, and you could just go and enjoy a nice dinner with your friends, you know. Just, just imagine if the American Heart Association um, was out of business and no longer forced seed oils to be used at every single cafeteria 
you know, in, in the United States now that gets any kind of government funding. So they no longer force force that, and at least left it up to, to people. Some universities and colleges would make the healthier choices, but right now they have no choice. And so that's why I'm so like adamant that I, I, this needs to change. And we need to, I think that we need to get doctors on board. And, and that's why I go a little bit into some of the science and dark calories, because I think it will convince the doctors. I hope it will. Yeah, you know, it's a book that every doctor should read. I mean, look, when, when you get a guy like me that sits here and talks to doctors every Friday, right? And I've been doing this for 10 years. <laughs> the first approach, or 12 years, thanks for reminding me that it's been forever. Um, the first approach is, ah, Kate wrote another book. Was going, But when you dive into this book and you can't put it down in your me, someone who thinks he knows all the information because... I get all of these experts in here and I'm reading this book all the way through until I see my name at the end, right? I mean, that that's how involved you get, right? Because it, it's in different sections. You start off with, you know, the hateful eight and the delightful dozen. And then there's a middle section where you talk about co cholesterol myth and the whole deal. It, it just kind of flows, right? And, and you can't stop. It's 400 pages, folks, and you're going to read it as if it's a quick novel. Right. Because it just flows that way. Um, I, I think it's your best work yet, Kate. And, and uh, I, I applaud you. And, and yes, I do think every doctor should should read this because, you know, I'm dealing with a brand new oncologist here. My last one was in L.A. I live in Virginia now. And this guy is great. He's a wonderful oncologist over at UVA Medical. Good. Lucky. But, you know, when I tell him about my diet, he's like, yeah, yeah whatever you want to do. Yeah, you know, they're not interested. In it. They're interested in the Medicaid. Here's the, you know, we have to put you on cladribine and then we have to put you on new so that you don't die and all that. I get it. I get what you're doing, but you can't discount what I'm doing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, seed oils and oxidative stress damage our bone marrow too, you know? And so how great would it be if you had a doctor that understood that and, you know, knew that it was, you know, that 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 plays some sort of a factor in getting this kind of thing in the first place as you, you know, many, many years ago. Um, but so we want to keep you alive, Vinny. And, you know, to do that, I want to keep you alive. And I want to dive a little bit more maybe into, if you want to do this, into what other sources of oxidative stress are out there in the food supply that might be coming to get you or maybe not you, but other people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's go right in. But wait, Kate, hang on to that for just a second. A little teaser there. Folks, we were talking about seed oils, but that, you know, there's good oils out there. And olive oil is one that Kate, I think, would agree with. Right, Kate? 100%. Yeah. And if you want to get 100% olive oil... <laughs> You want to get Villa Capelli. Look, there are other great olive oils out there. I can't go vet every brand. So why not vet the brand and, and tell you guys it's the best? Because they support this show and they have been supporting the show from the beginning. It's the longest running sponsor, Villa Capelli Olive Oil. You want to save 10%. Oh, by the way, folks, it's in stock now. It's back in stock. So go get Villa Capelli Olive Oil right now. Put in promo code Vinny for 10% off. Promo code Vinny. If you spend more than $125, so let me do the math. Spend about $140 minus 10%. You're still above $125. Free shipping. And when you're buying a three-liter tin of olive oil, free shipping, that's a big saving. So there's two ways to save at Villa Capelli. Go there right now, buy some oil, put in promo code Vinny, and uh, you will uh, love the product. I can't get enough of it. I use it when people say, Vin, which supplements do you take? I always mention olive oil, and they don't think that should be. Is it, wait, no, I was talking about supplements. Yeah, I supplement with olive oil every day. I have that in my body. As I say, I'm a diesel. I run on oil, and that's the oil I run on. It's an Italian diesel engine. I use Italian oil, Villa Capelli. We're talking to Dr. Kate Shanahan. She's been on the show a gazillion times. She's got a new book out called Dark Calories. It's already in the Vinny Book Club. If you go to vinnytoteries.com, it's in the Vinny Book Club. Her other books are in there also, but you want to read this one now because it's the most relevant information. Uh, you could tell just by listening to Dr. Shanahan here. As a matter of fact, so many people have asked me, Hey, can you call Dr. Drew? Can you call Adam Carolla? 
I made the phone call and said, you guys need to have this woman on. Oh. That, that, that's how much I believe, because they're always going, who should we have on? It's like, Kate Shanahan, just get her on. And um, I think Drew had you on also, right? Or did you? Yeah. Have, uh, I've been on his show a number of times. Yeah. Since, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I mean, you know, Drew and I, we were texting back and forth earlier today. I love the guy, and uh, your message needs to be out there. Everyone needs to hear what you're talking about. Bottom line, uh, let's get a little more into what you were just talking about. What's going on? What should we know? So we need to know about this thing called oxidative stress. It sounds very abstract, but it's very pertinent to health. Um, oxidative stress has to do with a uh, dangerous high energy chemical or molecule particles, dangerous high energy particles that are a little bit like radiation called free radicals. And um, about uh, 1950 something, a man named Denim Harmon, who is now a giant in the field of medicine, he founded a field called free radical biology. And basically what he said was, if you want to know what makes us sick and die, you have to follow the free radical. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him a little bit. Right. But oxidative stress causes free radicals to develop in our cells. And that will destroy our membranes. It will destroy our enzymes. It will destroy our mitochondria and our DNA. Everything the cell is trying to do is destroyed by oxidative stress. Vegetable oil is oxidative stress in a bottle. It's the worst of the worst. And when we talk about, you know, risk factors in medicine, we don't talk about root causes in medicine. You know, you go to your doctor and you have high blood pressure. If you ever ask him what causes this, he's going to say, oh, well, I don't know. It's maybe family history. Uh, maybe you're overweight. It's what we call an idiopathic disorder. And the word idiot in there means like uh, doesn't mean stupid. Actually it means self like self. Uh, there's no explanation. It's just in and of itself. It is what it is kind of thing. Um, but a lot of people have said, yeah, it means uh, your doctor is stupid because he doesn't really know the root cause. But we should know this because oxidative stress is quite clearly the root cause of what kills us at the cellular level. And that's where disease starts at the cellular level. If we can keep our cells healthy, we can keep ourselves healthy. And oxidative stress, you know, is actually what eventually kills us. And we have all kinds of uh, forces in our body that are that fight oxidation. But vegetable oil depletes those forces. Now, uh, we've talked a lot about vegetable oil, but there's a and vegetable oil is the worst of the worst. But there are a few other things out there, Vinny, that I want to tell people about because a lot of folks don't know. Um, about at least about one of them. <laughs> Go on. So yeah, so the other two are empty calories in the form of um, you know sugar and refined carbohydrates, right? Like the refined grains and all that kind of stuff, right? Those are empty calories. Those are out there and they promote oxidative stress because they don't give us our bodies the nutrition that we need to make that arsenal of free radical oxidative stress fighting enzymes and antioxidants and all the good things our body needs to make to control that um, oxygen in our in our body cells. So we need nutrition to do that and empty calories don't have that. But so that's that's three things so far. But the fourth thing is something that not a lot of people talk about. And honestly, I'm a little bit nervous talking about it because I never know if somebody has sponsored something like this in the past. And that is a, a, a um, protein powder. Um, yeah, so protein powder is not normal protein, and it, we're not designed to go out and you know hunt down powder. We're designed to hunt down muscle and you know whole food animals and eat the vegetables that we eat that have protein in them, like the nuts and the seeds. That is whole food is very different to our body than the whey protein and the pea protein and the hydrolyzed vegetable protein and all these things that are also in Impossible Burgers and a lot of vegan foods, um, very different. And those things are also can promote oxidative stress quite powerfully, in fact, possibly more powerfully than sugar. So I, I like to say that like protein powder is to steak 
as sugar is to broccoli, right? Because broccoli has some carbohydrates in there. Right. It's not bad carbs. It's it's gets in your system very slowly, doesn't cause you know damage, doesn't cause this thing called glycation, which promotes oxidative stress. So understanding the chemistry, these chemical terms I'm just throwing around, you don't have to know any of these to be able to, you know, get through the read the book and understand the book. I'm throwing them around to show you that I'm not making this up. This is based in chemistry. And it, it's chemistry is more foundational and more fundamental to how the body works than the science of nutrition these days. Well, I'm glad you brought up the powdered protein thing because, you know, I do these, I still do consults. I, I don't get to train people anymore. So the, the only way I keep my ear to the ground is to do consults so people can sign up. And I talk to people five days a week. And inevitably, they'll say, which protein powder do you recommend? And I always say, I don't. Good. Okay. Phew. I, I, I don't. And Very good. Say, That's the right advice. If I take a real clean and I'll say, look, okay, here's the cleanest one. It's whey protein. It's a byproduct. It's rennet. It comes from rennet. It comes from, you know, the byproduct of cheese and they don't know what to do with it. So they turn it into a powder and they sell it to you and then you reconstitute it and drink it. Now, they're, they're, and the other question I get is, you know, because I own a vitamin company, I'll go, when are you going to do a protein powder? And the answer is never. Because there is no protein powder, you know, that outdoes red meat or eggs, right? There, there is none. And Kate, the money, notice, I've, I've done all the ads I'm going to do on this show today. I did a, 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 an olive oil ad. You know how many powdered companies and, and protein bars and, and drinkable protein cans? You know how many of, you know how much, how rich I could be right now if I ran those ads on this show? Seriously, you know, and my husband is always saying, what is wrong with you? Why don't you just, you know, <laughs> sell some kind of a, you know, energy powder or something like that? And I'm like, I can't do it. No, I, same here. It's like I sit there with this huge audience and go, oh, man, oh, man. You know, just like, you know, I own the term NSNG and, you know, big business industry has come to me and said, hey, can we buy your NSNG to put on this product to make it NSNG certified. And it's like when my attorneys look at the deal, they can change what's in the product at any time, yet my contract won't be up with them. So they can change and put anything. So I can look at the product at the time and go, oh, yeah, that's an SNG. Here, it's approved. And then they can just change it. And I have no say-so, right? right? Can't do it. The money I leave on the table because I'm stupid enough not to go make the money because the one commitment I made after I saved, after my own life was saved from cancer was I will never tell a lie on this podcast ever. And look, today you changed my mind on something that I've been steadfast on forever. I tell people no peanut oil. And then I read your book and say, like, wait, I got to bring up, I could have easily kept that quiet and never brought it up. Right. But I went right to look, the delightful dozen. It, let me pull one out of there that I never agreed with. And you've changed my mind on that. Well, but you're thinking like a scientist, Vinny. You you know, that's what impressed me from the very beginning when you told the story about how, wait a second, we're talking about, you know, burning sugar for energy, but what about all this fat we have on our body? You know, you think more yeah. like a scientist than, you know, unfortunately, well, I a whole come bunch from of a science doctors. background. And, and you see, I'm not a hammer looking for a nail. That's, <laughs> that's just who I am. Yeah. I, look, we live in a world with everybody, you know, doing their, their research, which means they went to Google and read a sponsored ad. So everyone's doing their research and everyone has their, you know, it's my truth and your truth and all thing. I'm always looking for the truth. There's a universal Hallelujah. truth behind everything. Yes, and there is. And, you know, and that's like so important, I think, to understand where it comes from, too. And maybe you came to the same conclusion, but it comes from nature, right? Nature is the real scientist here. Nature is the one that's created everything, us. And she wrote the rules. Yeah. We've just got to figure them out. 
And so when you have that respect of nature, then you can ask questions like you did uh, well before I did. You know, I, I, when you told the story about how you were in college, I didn't think through any of this stuff until I, way after college. And you were sitting there listening to the, the sports nutritionist tell you stuff, how we use sugar for energy and sugar, our brain needs sugar, sugar, sugar. And none of them said anything about, well, why do we have this fat on our body? Why did nature do that to us? If it, if we well, you, have it a, you have a ridiculous memory. Yeah, the way the story <laughs> goes is that same professor about a month earlier, because I took like crazy notes. I, I was that guy in class. I was just filling up notebooks. Every word was being written down. And I have a weird photographic memory about everything I read or write. It, it just, it's in my head. I can't get rid of it. And um, I'm right. And he, a month earlier, he said, our body's preferred fuel is fat. And that was written down in uh, fat. Okay. And then uh, the same professor was talking a couple of months. He's like, well, when you do aerobic exercise and this and that, and, and your body needs sugar to, you know, it's the preferred fuel. Right. And I'm writing and I'm going, that's not what he said. So right. flip, I'm flipping back in notebooks while he hand goes up. Professor, you said on September 28th that uh, <laughs> it was fat. And he goes, no, it's sugar. I said, well, what's going to be on the test? Because you said, you said fat was the body's preferred fuel less than three weeks ago. And now you're saying we need sugar. And he goes, yeah, it's sugar. And I said, so should I scratch out fat? He goes, no, your brain needs fat. Your body needs fat as fuel. And I went, again, what's going to be on the test? What, what, what are we talking, you know, where's the truth? Good for you. Right. Yeah, and, you're thinking like a lawyer, too, and a scientist. Well, because <laughs> I, I didn't care about feelings. I, I, I'm somewhat of a savant. I don't care about someone's feelings. I just want the truth. And that's what this podcast is, is how do we get to the truth Right. I don't care. You know, you want to be a vegan, knock yourself out. But I don't need McDougal coming on saying that the way you get rid of diabetes is by eating more rice and sugar. By the way, there's a video where he's saying those words. That is not the truth. That's how you get diabetes. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's definitely one way that you can get diabetes. If you combine that with alcohol and seed oils. Absolutely. There's a yeah. lot of routes to get sick. And all of them have to do with oxidative stress. And frankly, Vinny, it shouldn't be me trying to tell the world about oxidative stress, thanks to you and other folks like you who generously agree to have me come on the podcast. It shouldn't be me alerting the world to, hey, you know, all I'm doing is connecting the dots between what this Dr. Denham Harmon said in the 1950s, follow the free radical, I'm paraphrasing him, follow the free radical and you find the source of death and disease. Um, the, the thing he didn't know back then was that what vegetable oils were, right? Like they were not in the food supply to much of an extent right. back then. And mm -hmm. so what he, the rest of his life, he spent trying to control oxidative stress, but it didn't work, right? You can't supplement your way out of a diet that promotes oxidative stress. You can't, there's no, uh, nothing in the world that controls oxidative stress better than our bodies naturally will. And this gets us back to my respect for nature because the idea that you can do better than nature, I think is a dead end game, honestly. You know, there's all these folks out there trying to hack their way into living to 120. Good luck with that. Let's, let's, I mean, it's not a bad goal. I'm not saying we shouldn't try. But what they're not doing is putting any kind of priority on what you shouldn't do, you know, first. And they're 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 saying there's like everything is equally important, right? Do you get that sense when you listen to some of these biohackers? You got to use red light. You got to use, uh, you know, you got to do everything all at once, all the time. There's right. no hierarchy. And the first thing we need to do is put our bodies right with nature. And these vegetable oils, these dark calories in our food supplies, they take us out of nature. They denature literally our body at the, at the chemical level. They, they reformulate our body fat. And we might not have time to get into this, but they drive diabetes. Uh, according to my research, they drive diabetes more powerfully than sugar 
because get this, they, they make our cells need to use sugar for energy. When we've got so much of this, the polyunsaturated fat in our bo own body fat, that, that type of fatty acid was never meant to be f fueled. Not all of our body fat is meant to be fueled. And the polyunsaturates are not meant to be fuel. They're meant to be signaling molecules. So when we have oils that contain way too much of these chemicals that are meant to be signaling molecules, never meant to be fuel, our mitochondria cannot use them to generate energy for our cells and they become sugar addicts. And that makes your body not function right. That's the root of insulin resistance. I call it the energy model of insulin resistance because it comes down to not getting energy from our body fat. And it's so important to understand that concept because it will help you make the easy choice first. The easy choice being avoid vegetable oils because vegetable oils drive you to sugar, but sugar doesn't drive you to vegetable oils. And until you get your metabolism right, your cells still need sugar and you're gonna be fighting these cravings. And so I teach you how to, how to deal with that in dark calories without totally cutting down all the sugar that your cells still need a little bit of it um, while you're insulin resistant. You know, it's most, it's definitely none of the refined grains and no, you know, no, no added sugars. Um, but having some of the higher vegetable, I mean, sorry, higher carb vegetables and, you know, beans, um, and nuts that have carbohydrates in them can do you a lot of good while you're still insulin resistant because your cells still need sugar. So I hope that makes sense. It's a, it's a, it does. it's a little confusing because yeah. we, you got sciencey there and I can listen to you talk like that all day. I, I would have a four hour conversation with you just doing that. But the average person is going to go, wait a minute, Dr. Shanahan. I have a problem now. What should I eat? They don't care about the science, right? They want to just know what to eat. And I think this is a good segue into the delightful dozen, right? Great. These are things you should eat. Yes. Right? Because look, I, you know, you, you just said everything all at once, right? So you said, okay, seed oil can, can drive the fact that you want to now eat more sugar. I get that, but people are doing everything all at once anyway. They're, they're right. stopping at Subway sandwiches where you're getting seed oils and carbohydrates in droves. They're stopping at uh, McDonald's or, or even worse, they're going to the third biggest fast food restaurant in the world, which is also known as Starbucks, and getting seed oils and sugars in a drink, a big drink. They don't seem to be small drinks. So that's what people are doing. Right. Right. How can people do better? Yeah, so um, the the back of the book tells you how to make super fast, simple meals that are faster than going through a drive through. It's just that um, we need permission to do these things, right? So, uh, for example, peanut butter on celery. You're going to get healthy fats from starting from whole food peanuts, and you're going to get some of those. Um, healthier carbohydrates that your cells still need just a few, just a few, um, will really help sustain your energy between meals so you don't need to snack. Um, so, so peanut oil we talked about, peanuts, of course, have peanut oil. Um, but the other members of the Delightful Dozen, my favorites are butter, olive oil. Um, I love peanut oil. It tastes so good. I use sesame oil um, and I use... Um, coconut oil. Those are like my favorite five. <laughs> then there's, there's a lot of other healthy fats out there. All of like the culinary oils, the fancy oils, most people wouldn't be getting anyway, like um, almond oil and macadamia nut oil, all the other nuts. Very oils. expensive and, and not expensive. usable on, on a daily basis. Right. right. And then, then there's more common, less expensive, like tallow and lard. Although, you know, if you want to get them organic and stuff like that, they become very expensive too, but they are healthy for you if you can find a good cheap source. Um, another real simple, like almost so good, it's a life hack kind of thing is bacon. Save your bacon fat and yeah. um, don't reuse it multiple times, but 
add it to, uh, you know, salad dressing, cook your eggs in it, throw it in the pan when you're stir frying anything and it'll taste really good. Yeah. Um, so that's another one. So you want to get these healthier fats and then, um, you know, you want to know how to turn food into a meal. So I teach you that, like, I don't just give you lists of, yes, yeah, sure, some healthy, healthy, healthy carbohydrates come from nuts, they come from seeds, they come from um, certain legumes. And you can even get uh, some, I think that, you know, sprouted grain breads are probably okay for most people, unless you have celiac disease or gluten intolerance. Um, and, you know, whole grain rice, uh, not not whole grain rice, I'm sorry, I misspoke, wild rice. Right. Um, or yeah. less a grass. It's a grass. Thing. Basically, yeah. Uh, and it's so much more, so many more minerals in it. Um, like, so I teach you, I have a week, uh, a two week challenge in there. And I give you a whole bunch of just different, really fast meal ideas that you can make. Like, Another example is just like a sandwich, a simple sandwich with a healthier kind of bread that I recommend. Or if you want to do gluten-free bread, that's great too. Um, but just like sandwich meat that's nitrate free and cheese slices and condiments that are seed oil free, uh, which are most of them um, except mayo. So you want to get, you know, seed oil free mayo or skip it. Um, but like, I just give you practical stuff like that. So you can be out the door in the morning with your lunch in a bag and having thrown together a healthy lunch that didn't require any cooking, right? I think it's so important. We always think, okay, well, so if I'm gonna make everything from scratch, I, I have to cook everything. No, <laughs> you don't have to cook a lot of stuff. You can, I mean, the sandwich isn't cooked, right? And um, neither is yogurt, right? Just make better yogurt than what they sell you in the store. So that's all I do like in the back third of the book is I help you just upgrade stuff. You already probably are eating just with healthier ingredients and um, helping you know like what really is going to help you fight oxidative stress, like that root cause knowledge it, it gets you over the hump of everything, literally. Like there's toxins out there we could be talking about too. And they're bad for you because they cause oxidative stress. But they're so small, the amount is so small, it doesn't cause much oxidative stress. So that's why I don't emphasize being organic even as, as, right. as important as avoiding these four main ingredients in the food supply that, um, so that cause oxidative stress with the worst of the worst being the vegetable oils. Does that, does that help kind of clear it up and make well, it, it, it does. Right? And that, that puts it in a way. And by the way, I, people, one of the things they'll say is, Oh, you know, I, I, I eat cereal or a cereal bar in the morning or because it's easy and it's fast. And it's like, let me tell you something. If you don't have time in the morning, wake up 10 minutes earlier. If that's too much of a big deal for you, boil eggs twice a week and you got eggs all week long. You can, yeah. boil, you can go Monday through Thursday on, on a, a dozen and then do another dozen for the rest of the week and you're, you're done. And, and by the way, peel them at night before you go to bed. You just pop them in your mouth. You, you, you want to talk about getting all the amino acids and fatty acids and everything you need. It's all in one little product called an egg and they go and, and very smart people will sit there and go huh why didn't i think of that it's like, i don't know i don't know why you didn't think of that i thought of it so here you go uh, kate i don't want to keep you forever but i got i got one or two more things i want to bring up and i'm sure. hoping we can get through them faster are, are you okay with that yeah absolutely Vinny. okay um you mentioned uh, cholesterol, the cholesterol, the myth of cholesterol. And I've had cardiologists after cardiologists do whole shows about cholesterol. So, but you talk about it in the book. So I wanted to bring it up here because I always like smart people to talk about cholesterol because every, that's one of the questions I get on, on my phone calls. It's like my cholesterol went up 20, my doctor wants me to be on a statin and I'll say to him, I'm not a doctor but just tell me, what's your total cholesterol? And they'll say, it was 198. And he said my LDLs to my HDLs were a great ratio, but he wants me on a statin. And I'll say, well, what was your triglycerides? Oh, he didn't, he didn't check that. Oh, what was your small dense particles? Oh, he, he didn't, he didn't get into that. I said, so he didn't do a particle test. What about your APO A, APO B? No, oh, I, I don't know. Okay. So a doctor wanted to put a cast in your arm, but it wasn't broken. Is that what you're telling me? 
So I go even farther than that. Cholesterol is a nutrient. And part of the reason I wanted to write the book, I have an entire chapter in there to help get people get over their program fear of cholesterol. I was programmed with that fear. And the first you know, time I was on your show, I still thought that an LDL, you know, more than three times their HDL level might be a bad thing. But, you know, now I know I can and I can see with confidence that LDL is not out there to kill us. LDL is not the problem. The problem is oxidative stress. And when our diet is healthy, that LDL is going to be healthy. Your, your LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. And when the fats in your diet and the fats in your body are are healthy, then everything that's circulating in your bloodstream is healthy. You know, one of the things that maybe you talked about before in the movie Game Changers, did you talk about that movie? And Ad how- nauseum, yeah, we, we've uh, debunked it five different ways. So yeah. here's another way. So they talk about, um, you know, the, the they hold up that vial of blood, right? And they show this is your this is your blood, you know, on a regular diet and this is your blood on a vegan diet. And the vegan diet has less fat in it. Right. Um, And so the vegan blood has less fat in it. But guess what? There's this saying blood is thicker than water. Our blood is supposed to have stuff in it. When there's fat in our blood, that means our blood can give us energy. If there's no fat in our blood, that means the only thing that's going to give us energy is a teensy little bit, that teaspoon of sugar that's in there. That's not enough. And so the idea that's related to cholesterol, because it's cholesterol that makes up the bulk of that stuff in there that that game changers guys were showing you, oh, you don't want that in your blood. That's not true. You want that in your blood. That is energy. That is satiety. Cholesterol is a nutrient. It's the building block of all all of your cell membranes. And it's what makes us fertile. It's the building block of testosterone and estrogen. And so I I wrote the, uh, the chapter in there so that people can just, you have to get over your fear because your doctor is going to still has the fear, right? Until he reads the book. <laughs> Hopefully that'll help him get over it a little bit. But um, it took it takes a while. It took me years. Uh, and, and, you know, I wrote these chapters in the way that I wrote them to help people understand what went wrong with the medical system so that you can defend yourself against the worst parts of the medical system. You know, it's not all bad, right? You know, right now, they're, you're going into the medical system, but you have to know what they do right and what they do wrong. You went into the medical system knowing full well the good stuff from the bad stuff. And, but you, you know, you've learned that over a lifetime of talking, there's a lot of years, not a lifetime of talking to doctors, but I want to put that in a book for people so they understand it. Um, And that's why I wrote the dark calories. And it comes down to our wrong fear of cholesterol and understanding where that came from. Yeah, no, it, 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 it was incredible. And I, I was glad that you included that. You know, it's interesting you bring up game changers in my third documentary. Be, have you, you probably haven't seen Beyond Impossible, if you get a chance. No. So, yeah, I'm, I'm coming out with my fourth documentary. Awesome. It's coming out. The fourth one is coming out this Friday. It's called Dirty Keto. I'm actually going after me and my ilk in Dirty Keto. <laughs> what? And, and <laughs> You know, where we went wrong, but I did one called Beyond Impossible, where I went after Beyond Burger and Impossible Meat and explained how bad this stuff was. But I also debunked Game Changers because that movie had just come out and everyone was going, what about Game Changers? It's like, there were so many lies in that movie that I could have done a whole movie called This Is What's Wrong With Game Changers, but that (laughs) title just doesn't ring. And I just showed people, it's like, look, even the athletes that they said were great athletes weren't who they said they were. They said, this, this is one of the strong, this is the strongest man in the world. And I went, wait a minute, I'm a nerd, right? So I've been watching the strongman competition since wide world of sports used to do it back in the seventies. And I went, okay, I still follow that competition. This guy does not look like those guys. Number one, I can't imagine he's even in the competition, much less one of the strongest men on the planet. So I looked into the guy and it turns out that most high school weightlifters can out weightlift this guy. As a matter of fact, he was the strongest vegan at a competition in Texas at a vegan, I don't know, 
kind of like a vegan thing. And, um, and they had a strength competition. So he was the strongest vegan in the world. But, wow. And they don't say that. They just say he was the strongest man in the world. And the same with the Olympic athletes. It's like, this is a gold medal. You know, they didn't say gold medal. Say Olympian. She wasn't even in the Olympics where they show it on television. She didn't make it to that round. Right. It's doctors need to watch your shows too, you know, because like that kind of stuff, it influences them and the doctors are influenced by other doctors and the American, um, the, the doctors who are leading the nutrition conversation is the American college of lifestyle medicine, who are a bunch of Adventists, you know, it's a religion, nothing wrong with it as a religion, but as a, the, as a science, it is a failure because it is a religion. It is not a science by its very definition, but that the Adventist church and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine picks up these these movies and just repeats them, repeats them like they're gospel truth. And they don't get exposed. The doctors don't get exposed to like your side of the story. And, you know, you're you're not a doctor. Right. So, like, why should they, they listen love to, to you? Use that. They, they love to use that. Well, you're not an MD. <laughs> right? right. Exactly. And so, right. like, that's how I would have thought, too. Right. Like, Because we don't know what we don't know. And when it comes to nutrition, we don't know. That our that all of nutrition science has been tainted by the vegetable oil industry's takeover of the American Heart Association that began in 1950, and so like that is something that is a, just a core message that doctors need to know this because we just don't know that our education has been hijacked by the processed food industry. And that the American Heart Association is part of that evil empire. And nobody should be listening to them as a source of nutrition information, but they lead the conversation. So your next documentary, number six, can you do that one? Uh, would you be in it? <laughs> yeah, I'd be in it. Yeah, let's sue the American Heart Association. Let's get a lawyer and do a documentary about trying to sue them. Um, wow. Wow. I, let's see, I would have you. I, I can already see the cast. Uh, Nina Teichos would have to be in there. Zoe Harcom. Oh, I can, yeah, I can make this work. Folks, if you buy my next doc, Kate, what I do is, the only way I make documentaries is if the money comes back from the last documentary. Okay. So if people buy Dirty Keto, I'll have the money to go do, uh, I, I'll call it Dirty, I don't know, Dirty Hard. I don't know, I'll figure it out. Here's the deal. I, I want to keep it for just one more minute, Kate. Can, you know, one more minute. Can I do one more one more question? Mm, for you, Come Vinny, on. of course. Okay. <laughs> okay. People hate me for this one. I, so I get, I get, when I do this on my Instagram, I get more hate mail than any other time. But as I always say, look, I don't know what the truth is. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't think we're going down a good road with the GLP-1s, with the uh, Recovery, I, the Ozempic. <laughs> I don't think we're, you know, we're it's like the electric to. car. Everyone wants an electric car, but they haven't thought through it yet. It's like, hey, we're going to have all these batteries that we can't get rid of, and we have no idea how to dispose of these batteries. And by the way, we're not, we're not saving the ozone layer because there's a, an electric plant that has to spew stuff into the atmosphere before you could put electric energy into that battery. So you're not thinking through it. The same way I feel about GLP-1s, we're not thinking through it. What say you? GLP-1s are appetite suppressants that um, blast the body with a molecule that tells your brain it's okay that you're not getting energy from your body fat so you don't feel so hungry. Um, and instead, so as a result, people are burning body fat that their body cells don't want to burn. So this is bad. Our bodies, we are, this is a disrespect of nature. So at that top level, are we respecting nature or are we disrespecting it? It goes into the disrespect column because we are not working with nature. We are not making our metabolism healthier. We are suppressing a very essential function of biology, which is hunger. We have people who um, are overweight, have an insatiable hunger. They have food noise that is occurring because of their body fat is 
reformulate and it doesn't give their brain energy. It doesn't stimulate that appetite uh, satiety center in the brain the way nature designed. Ozempic takes care of that problem. Ozempic shuts down the food noise with a thousand times the amount of this appetite suppressant called GLP-1 that's normally in our bloodstream, a thousand times, okay? And so it shuts down a very important signal, which is your body telling you, you need to eat something because the body fat that we're getting is not giving us energy here, us being your body cells. Your body cells are trying to communicate to your brain to eat something. That is why we have an obesity epidemic, because our body cells are telling our brains we need to eat between meals. That is what causes hangry, okay? That is what we're shutting down by giving people Ozempic. And I've used the drug for diabetes, but I've only used it in conjunction with a healthy diet. And I've only used it in, a, in conjunction with a specific advice. You don't want to lose weight too fast because- huh. You'll be forcing, you're, you're forcing your body cells to burn harmful fuels. And we're already seeing this problems from this. Peter Atia just put a pretty viral video up about how he's doing body compositions on his uh, patients that he gives GLP-1. And instead of getting um, like, a, you know, instead of losing, you always lose a small amount of muscle lean tissue when you lose weight. Probably about 20%. Yes, 20, 25%. Yes. Um, people are losing up to 60% and it's coming from who knows where, but it's, you know, certainly their muscle and their bones, probably their heart. We're also starting to see some heart problems with um, Ozempic. Surgeons are starting to see some bizarre complications of back surgery when people have been on Ozempic. Um, so we're, 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 taking our body's important organs and breaking them down for energy because our bodies are not using that body fat. It is, I think we're going to see cancers coming from this. So don't get me wrong. The drugs are good for diabetes, but I think that using them for weight loss is way worse than not well, losing weight. You, know, you say it's good for diabetes, but if you watch the ads on television, they'll say, Hey, you can get your diabetes down to a, an AC. You, your AC ones will be down to seven point zero, and I'll go. Okay, yeah. so you're taking a drug that's keeping you perfectly sick. Congratulations. So yeah, you could drop it from twelve to seven in A one C. You'll never get healthy with drugs. You're you know? not getting. You need to change. You're right. You you. I love the fact that you gave it to people and said, okay, we also need to fix your diet. Right. And I think if more doctors took that approach, other than just giving them the jab, then we could have a healthier America. Um, Kate, I can't thank you enough for being here. By the way, don't go away because, you know, we got to we got to do all this stuff at the end. Um, folks, go out right now. You can go to VinnyTotteries.com or you can go straight to Amazon. Either way, it's going to be in the Vinny Book Club. It's called Dark Calories. Dr. Kate Shanahan, you want to get that book right now. Kate, I'm moving you up to this Friday. Um, you were going to be coming out three weeks from now. This podcast is being moved up to this Friday. And for that reason, I'm telling you guys, this is the 31st, this Friday. My new movie is also out on Amazon, only on Amazon this time. And it's called Dirty Keto. Go get it, watch it, rate it, and review it right away so we can hit that algorithm. Okay, so you got to go to Amazon for two reasons. One, you got to get this incredible book. And I'm telling you, for a scientific book, it is a page turner. It's a page turner. And there's so much I didn't even get to that we could have talked about with this book. You have to go get it. So get Dark Calories by Dr. Kate Shanahan. And while you're at Amazon, pick up my movie, Dirty Keto. Okay, that's all you have to do. So on behalf of Dr. Kate Shanahan, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and let's do it with just a little bit more.